series that we're in is that I, we just don't want to tickle your ears with good things to say. This series wasn't intended for that. This series was intended to break you out of the normality of Christianity and bring you, to, bring you into a, a new realm in your relationship with the Lord. I hope you understand. I think that sometimes we don't always understand what we say when we ask God things like, Oh, Holy Spirit, will you come? Do we know what that means? You know, we say it's cliche. We say it in worship services. We say, oh, Holy Spirit, will you come? Do, we, do you know what that means? Do you understand that the God that created the heavens and the earth, that God, the God of the universe, he will not share his glory with anyone. And yet when we invite him to come, a lot of times we want him to come, but we want to be in control. So do we know what we're asking God when we say things like, oh, God, break my heart? Do we know what we're asking him when we're saying, God, search me? You're asking the God that knows everything to search every part of your heart. That's why they're dangerous prayers. And that's why not everyone's called to pray this. I guarantee you, listen, not everyone will pray the prayer I'm asking you to pray today. Because when you understand what, what it entails, you might just say, that's not for me. I should have never came to church this, today. <laughs> Let's open up in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you your word says, Father God, that in the last days, Father God, in those days, it says your people, people will worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, I thank you for your spirit. I thank you that we worship you in spirit. But Father God, we will not forget the truth of your word. We need the truth of your word in order to worship you in spirit. We have to know your word to know who you are so that we can know what you like when we worship you, Father. And so, Father, we pray in Jesus' name today that you would open our hearts to receive your word. And, Father God, we thank you that it heals us, restores us, it calls us, it sets us on a solid rock. Father God, it secures our future, Lord Jesus. It changes the trajectory of our life. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, get your Bibles, and if you don't have your Bibles, you can watch on screen, but I like people who bring Bibles to church. I really do. You're my favorite kind of people. I have my Bible right here. Decided to pull out an oldie. This is a, my old New King James Version of the Bible. I said, I'm going to pull you out, and I've been reading in this, and I've even been dabbling in the King James lately. If y'all hear me speaking, you know, with the, I'm going to start prophesying in the thus and the they and the thou. ha, <laughs> ha. Well, we've been talking about dangerous prayers, and in week one, um, I, uh, we opened up and we said, God, make me bold. And I hope you've been praying that and making that a regular prayer of yours, because you see, when you ask, I, I, it's one thing for us to say, God, make me bold, and never act on it. You don't pray anything unless you're going to really step out in faith. I mean, don't say, God, bless me with this, and then go, don't go get it. So we pray, God, make me bold. And that was make you bold because you have to understand that in order for you to step out in this world to do the things that God wants you to do, it takes boldness. Because it is intimidating what we have to deal with sometimes. Last week, of course, my wife shared a word with you. And she said, God, speak to us. God, speak to me. We need God to speak. And if you've never heard the voice of God, listen, you want it. Once you hear it, you want to hear more of it. But it takes time. He wants to know how badly you want to know. And so today, like I said, you probably won't like this prayer. Uh, some of you are very likely might refuse this prayer uh, because it's not a common prayer. It's not an easy prayer. It's not one of those prayers that's consistent with all of our lives. It just says, Lord, would you make my life easy? I just want an easy life. Come on, that's a great prayer, isn't it? God, I want an easy life. You know, I want this Americanized, popular Christian life. I want to live that life, God. You know, can I tell you that it's okay? It's okay to pray easygoing prayers occasionally. Like, you know, who, who doesn't want to be blessed? I want to be blessed, right? I want God to keep me safe. Those are great little prayers because the truth is, how many of you want to be inconvenienced? We don't want to be inconvenienced. We really don't. We don't. You know, and we sometimes we get this idea in our minds. We're like, God, if you really, really love me, Father, then why don't you give me a hassle-free day, a pain-free day, a good food, green lights, nice people, well-behaved kids, no zits on important days kind of prayer. Like, Lord, I, you know, prom is coming up. I don't, I don't want those there on my nose. I'm prom. 
You know, we pray those prayers. Have you ever been in front? Lord, please, no, no, not now. Not. Come on, we pray those prayers. We're all guilty of praying those prayers, but that's not the prayer that I'm going to share with you today. Because this prayer is not a safe prayer. It's one of the most dangerous prayers because if you pray this prayer, I'm, I'm more, than, more than likely God will answer this prayer and you might just be frustrated. This prayer says, God, would you break me? Break me. Because you have to understand that following Jesus was never meant to be safe. God, would you break my heart? God, would you crush it? Would you strip, strip me of every bit of me and every bit of spiritual apathy in my life? Now, I want to warn you, when you pray this prayer, God will answer it. God will answer this prayer. And you're going to find yourself burdened, grieved in your heart, aching over something that burdens the heart of God. That is what it means when you say, God, break my heart. You, as a, in church, growing up, I used to say these, oh, God, break my heart. Oh, God. We never understood what it meant. We're just saying, okay, no, no, no. It takes on a whole different meaning. And what happens is when you do, you're going to start to learn that your heart begins to burn. Sometimes with a righteous anger. You might find yourself doing things that other people won't understand. You might find yourself saying things that other people might just start to persecute you about. I'm telling you, and you might find yourself sometimes that you're in agony and pain, not physical, but a pain in your soul and discomfort and agony that you can't find. You won't, but you'll still find yourself blessed because you've been burdened by something that comes from God. It's something that breaks the heart of God. And therefore you said, God, let me feel what you feel. Can I feel what you feel, God? You got to be careful when you pray those kinds of prayers. If God's about to let you feel what he feels for his people, your perspective will change. If you feel you've got an inkling of racism in your life, I promise you when you say God breaks my heart for what breaks yours, racism cannot exist in your life. If you're prejudiced, if there's anything in your life and you say God break me, it doesn't exist in his life. And he's going to make you feel the pain he feels for his people, for the lost, for the hurting, for the broken. When we oversee and overlook and talk about and judge, he, no, no, no. He says, you want to feel what I feel? Let me show you. When he say, break my heart of God. And today we're going to look at the prophet Jeremiah, which, by the way, didn't have a great nickname. He was also known as the weeping prophet. Weeping prophet because his heart was breaking over the plight of the people of Israel because God's heart was broken over them as well. You see, I'm going to give you a little bit of context and show you what was going on during the time of his life of Jeremiah. You see, the people of Judah, they were rebelling, outright rebelliousness against God. Complete rebellion. The leaders were abusing the, the lesser people. They were abusing widows. They were taking advantage of those that were poor. They were, they were sacrificing children to false idols. This was the people of God. When God warned them years ago, stay away from those people because you're going to pick up their things. And one of the things they picked up was they picked up sacrific sacrificing children yes. to idols. We wonder why we have a problem with abortion in our world. Yes. And Jeremiah was hurting on behalf of God. God, this isn't right. How can this be, God? How can these people who claim to know you, God, still behave like this? And I wonder how much different are they from the church today? How much we've compromised in what we call the truth, but it's not the truth. How much we believe certain things that were never God. We've said God said and God never said. And here they are in this instance, they're abusing people and mistreating those that are powerless. And Jeremiah's heart was breaking because God was allowing Jeremiah to feel what God was feeling for his people. And in Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 18 to 22, it says, hey, look what he says. He says, I would comfort myself in sorrow. My heart is faint in me. Listen, the voice, the cry of the daughter of my people from a far country. Is not the Lord in Zion? Is not her king in her? Why have they provoked me to anger with their carved images with foreign idols? Verse 20, the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. For the hurt of the daughter of my people, I am hurt. I am mourning. Astonishment has taken hold of me. He said, is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? 
Why then is there no recovery for the health of the daughter of my people? And the New Living Translation, that one verse, it says, my grief is beyond healing. And when I read that, I was like, oh my God. He said, my grief is beyond healing. There's no repair. It's great. My heart is broken. He said, I hurt for the hurt of my people. I mourn and I'm overcome with grief. My heart is crushed. My heart is broken because of the injustices of those who are being abused, right? Who don't have the power to defend themselves. They don't have the power to make things right. And so my heart is broken. So guess what Jeremiah did? He did what he knew to do. What did he do? He preached. He proclaimed in the streets. He he preached some of the most fiery sermons. Read about them. Read them in Jeremiah. The Bible says, fire shut up in my bones, right? And he prayed and he fasted and he stood strong and he threatened. He did everything he knew to do. And yet nothing changed immediately. But he still had a burden. And he said, my grief is unbearable. My heart is broken. And here's the question I have for you. Do you want that? No one in here wants to sign up right away for that. If I had a clipboard, passed it around, it'd be empty. No one wants to sign up for this grief. Because seriously, listen, I I don't know about you, but I I didn't want to wake up this morning. I don't want to wake up to pain. Who does? When I woke up this morning, I wanted a great day. Like I want to enjoy my day. I don't want any problems. I don't want heartache. I don't want grief. That's why this is a dangerous prayer. When you say, Lord, would you break my heart? Break my heart. And I'm not talking about when you see this guy on the side of the road that we all see. You know, you see the guy on the side of the road with the sign. You know, that doesn't break because you know what we can do? We can take him to lunch. We can give him some spare change. We can do those things. That's not the kind of stuff I'm talking about. I'm talking, what I'm talking about is a uh, gut-wrenching burden that consumes you so much that sometimes you can't even sleep. Have you ever been burdened by something like that? I'm talking something that doesn't let up, something that doesn't go away. It eats away at you. It gnaws at you. It bothers you at night. You think about it. You can't sleep sometimes because you think about, God, what, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? And the truth is, the truth is that God, you know, a lot of times you don't move, you're not moved to action because you don't have a burden. When you have a burden, you're moved to action. God has to break your heart so that you can see what he sees, so that you can hear what he hears, so that you can feel what he feels, so that you can have a burden and be moved to action. Because if not, you'll just stay in bed. That's the truth. Now, I know we all want the feel good version of Christianity. We all want that. The one that says God is for you. And he is. God is for you. God's going to make your life better. He will if you let him. That everything's going to multiply. This is the year of acceleration and increase. That's what we want, right? If you can see it, you can have it. If you can claim it, blah, blah, blah. That's the kind of, that's, the, that's what we want, God. Bless going in, bless going out. Bless going in, bless going out. Great. But could, could, listen, here's the question. God's greatest blessings come from God's greatest breakings in our lives. Is that not, could not, could not the greatest blessing in your life come from the place of the greatest brokenness in your life? I know it's not popular. We don't like this. I don't want to be broken. I don't want to be in, but what if this most, most significant blessing from God comes on the other side of the pain that moves you outside of yourself to do something for someone else? What if that's it? What would happen if God really broke your heart for the things that break his? We just sang that song and it sounded really good, really great singing it. But how about living it? I'm just being honest. It's, not, it's a dangerous prayer. What if God blessed you with a divine burden? <laughs> Can I tell you that, that, that I like comfort like the rest of y'all? I like comfort. I like to be comfortable. The problem is comfort never once moved me to action. Come on, you sitting there in your sofa watching your show. You ain't getting up for no one. The dishes need to be made. They can wait. Kids are crying. As long as there's no broken bones or bleeding, they can wait. Come on, let's be honest. Come on, think about the moment you've been the most comfortable. You're not getting out of there, are you? Right? Comfort, especially if it's your special chair. That you know that's got, that's got your imprint on it. And you got your cozy little blanket watching your little. You've been, you're already on season seven of your show. You are not getting up. Comfort. Because when you're comfortable, you don't get up. 
And sometimes, listen, in our Christian life, we're too comfortable, and God's got to put a burden in our heart to get us to move somewhere. The last time I was comfortable, I did not change the world. I did not change the world. You know why? Because comfort begets comfort. Comfort never shook me to care more about those that were suffering. Never. I don't like pain. I'm not lying to you. I like to have pain-free days. But pain-free days didn't make me more like Jesus. Let me show you this. We love this verse, Romans chapter 8, verse 16 and 17. We love this first part of the verse. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Yes, I love that. Praise God. And if children, then heirs. I love that too. Heirs of God and Joe heirs with Christ. Yes, if indeed we suffer with him. Well, that pastor, you lost me right there. What do, you, what do you mean suffer with him? That we may also be glorified together. Well, suffer? I like the first part. Suffer part. Here, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3. Look what Paul tells Timothy, his son in the faith. You, therefore, must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Come on now. I don't know if I like that. Then you're not going to like this next one. 2 Timothy 3, 12. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. <laughs> I don't like it. I want a blessed life. But there you go. What does pain do? Pain purifies us. It strengthens us. Trials actually make you more like Jesus and teach you dependency on God. Trials actually strip you of your plan B's. It snaps you out of your self-centered pursuit of always needing to be comfortable. It's a dangerous prayer. <laughs> and all of a sudden you see things differently when you pray that way. You see the hearts of those that are broken. You see it throughout Scripture. Moses watched as a young boy as he watched as the Egyptians beat his people until one day he left and was out on the backside of a mountain with a bunch of sheep. He saw the cruelty of the Egyptian people over Israel and he carried this burden in his heart for his people for decades until God let him come back to stand before the most powerful man in the world at that time with a heart breaking for his people and said, let my people go. David was a shepherd boy. The whole nation's at war and his dad says, hey boy, why don't you take some bread and some cheese over to you to the real men on the front battle line. Just take them to the boys on the front lines. And he goes and he notices that it's a standstill. Nobody's fighting. Nobody. He notices that the guys are kind of scared. And all of a sudden, you see, there's this giant that decides that he's going to curse God and curse the armies of God. And he happened to stumble upon this thing. And he says, wait, wait, is there not a cause? Who is this guy that gets to defy the name of my God? Something that was a burden inside of his heart. And we know the story. He's like, somebody get me a sling of some stones. Somebody. Nehemiah, Nehemiah had a kind of comfortable life. He lived in the palace, but his, he had a not so safe job. He was a wine tester. He had to make sure that the wine wasn't poison. But he lived a pretty comfortable life. He lived in the palace, and all he had to do was taste the wine and make sure it wasn't poison. And any time it wasn't poison, it was a good day. It was a great day. But here's what happened. One day he heard some bad news about his people, about his home. They had no, they had, the walls were broken down. They were vulnerable to any sort of attack. They had no support system, no identity, no sense of self-worth. They were vulnerable every moment and it crushed him to the point where the Bible says he fell on his knees and he began to weep and pray. He had a burden for his people. So much so that he put his own life at risk and he went before the king and begged him, can I go? And he went back, but listen to me, he's, he wasn't a builder. No experience in construction and somehow he figured out how to arrange a most miraculous sense of construction and stood before the people and said, fight for your families, fight for your wives, fight for your husbands, fight for your children, fight, fight, fight. It moved them out of comfort. Jesus was over on, mount, on the mount and at that time he looked over the city of Jerusalem and the Bible says he wept with compassion for his people because they, he, he was like, the living word is here amongst them and they don't even know it. 
And it broke his heart. How many of you, y'all remember the prophet, the prophet Popeye? Remember him? <laughs> remember he fights to the finish because he eats his spinach? Well, he had a girl. Her name was Olive Oil. She was fine to him. He loved olive oil. See, but whenever Brutus would come around, right, his arch nemesis, he would come around and harass his girl. And he got fed up. And he would say, that's all I can stand. I can stand no more. Do you remember when he would say that? And some of you listen to me. You're going to get to that point in your life that when you pray and I dare you to, you say, I can't stand no more. I'm really tired of the devil stamping in. Come on, you got to get to that place. I can stand no more. I promise you that when you pray this, God will shake you out of your pursuit of comfort. He will shake you out of it. God will give you a burden that you simply cannot ignore. When your heart breaks, you say, I can't stand no more. I'll never forget um, my wife and I back in 2002. And this is funny because when I was going over this message, this, these words became so loud and clear as we heard a little portion of a prophetic word over us that said, for there are a people sitting in darkness, crying out in darkness. And that little word, when I was in 2000, it didn't hit me as a burden. It wasn't burden then. It became a burden later. As those words became heavy, and I remember it was May of 2011, and we were here just trying to figure out. We hadn't moved yet. We were just trying to figure out things for our people. We were trying to fill out Orlando. Was this it? And one day we were back. We were tired. We were back at, at our Airbnb, and we turned on the news, and there it was. At that time, Orlando was the epicenter. Actually, Seminole County was the epicenter of the largest homeless population in Central Florida. They had just recovered over the, uh, uh, we had just been just on the back end of recovering from the housing market crash. So many people were homeless because of it, and our hearts were consumed by it. I'll never forget when we got on the ground, and Marcus is here. Marcus, his father, was with our church in the beginning. Bill Gibbons, he helped me to figure out a way that him and I would go and we would take food to the homeless. Not only that, he would set up Bible studies. We would go. I remember sitting in a parking lot at McDonald's doing a Bible study with homeless people. And we would go in and we would take them camping equipment because they didn't want to move. They just wanted upgrades. And we would go in and do things like that. But, but why? There was a burden. There was a burden. And over, over the years, listen to me, over the years it morphed. And I thank God that we were able to partner with the Orlando Rescue Mission. And it became a burden on Saturday to help provide food for people that needed it. And my heart is wrenching really because there's so many town, tons of thousands of people that we'll never be able to reach. There's an ache. God, would you break my heart? When you pray this prayer, you have to get ready to ache. You have to get ready for hurt. And I don't know what will break your heart. It might be the plight of the unborn. It might be. It might be for racial injustices in our communities. It might be to, you know, there, it might be so you, that you watch a, 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 a video and, and you see the little children in a village in Africa that if they don't get clean water, well, guess what? I'm going to figure out what to do to get clean water for them. It might be those that are trapped every day in financial bondage, or it might be for the children in our state that don't have a loving home. It might be for those that are suffering from mental illness or, or those that are trapped in addictions. I don't know, but it, it might be for those that are recovering from infidelity in marriages and don't know how to trust again. It might be for teenagers that are cutting themselves and live daily depressed and don't have good parental influences it might be for the thousands of children that are kidnapped and, and t- disappear into a sex slave it might be for something but you gotta have god break your heart for something last night i was debating showing you a video but i knew there were going to be children in here but we give to the a21 campaign and there's sometimes i wish we could do so much more When you see some of the children that they're rescuing and how they pulled them out to hear their stories. I saw one video last night of parents of a poor country. You know, you see, I know that the border is such a controversial issue right now. But I saw a video last night of parents that owed money to uh, drug dealers or landowners. I'm not quite sure. And because they didn't have the money, they took their children into forced labor. Nine and ten-year-olds. My boys. (laughs) 
today. It's not comfortable. And I wish we could do more. But when you pray this prayer, your heart breaks. And when it does, can I tell you, you have to thank God for it. Because it's better to hurt with a purpose than to exist without one. It's better to hurt with a purpose. So thank God for the burden. Thank God. Thank God. If he gives you a burden, God, I thank you. It hurts. God, it's uncomfortable. God, it's inconvenient. God, it takes time. God, people don't understand. But God, I thank you. It's your burden. It's a burden you've put inside of me. And God, you're moving me to action, Father God. The Apostle Paul, who was named Saul, was a religious zealot. And I love it because he, he talks in Philippians chapter 3, the things that he bragged about. And about his, his religious attributes in Philippians 3, chapter, chapter 3, verse 4 and 6, he said, more, I'm more so. He goes, I was circumcised on the eighth day. He goes, I'm the, of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. Concerning the law, come on, I was a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, I, well, I persecuted the church. Concerning righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. But when it came to know Christ, not religion, not rules, but when he had a relationship, what he said was this. He says, I consider all of this a loss compared to the suppressing greatness of knowing Christ. Philippians 3, 7, 8. But what things were gained to me? These I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ, of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. But look what he said. I count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. That word rubbish is actually in the Greek translated dung. I count them as crap. That's what Paul said. But I love what Paul said in Romans chapter 9, verse 1. And I need you to see this, how much he loved the people of Israel, how much he was devoted to seeing the Gentiles and the Jews say. He says, I tell, you, I tell the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. For I wish that I myself were accursed or separated from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. He was saying, my heart is filled with bitter sorrow and unending grief for my people, my Jewish brothers, my Jewish sisters, my kinsmen. He says, I would willingly be cursed or cut off from Christ if that would save them. This is how much I love them. Again, he says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 10. And look what he said. This is for the people. Therefore, I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Listen, he loved the people so much that he was willing to endure anything if it meant that they were going to receive salvation. And my question is, are we so consumed to see people come to Christ? He was willing to lay it all down. It's a dangerous prayer. It's a dangerous prayer. You know what? I was praying this prayer earlier this week. Lord, break my heart. And you know what I began to think about? I began, thinking, I began to think about all those people that come to church who think they have Christ, but instead they just have a head knowledge of Him. I began to grieve for those people that, that church isn't important to them anymore. I began to grieve and think about all the Christians that are bound up by such a legalism and rules that it's made them mean and critical and judgmental. And they've missed the beauty of grace and love of God. Break my heart, Lord. Would you break my heart? And when he does, be thankful. Because every day he's driving you to a higher calling. He's calling you to a heavenly purpose, right? I want to close with this story and I want to have the musicians come up and we're going to close and worship. But... Uh, I was in a, I was in a meeting um, this week with some pastors online and about five other pastors. And as we talked, I could hear the pain in a few of their voices, the disappointment, the hurt. You see, because these guys didn't just wake up one day and say, "I think I'll be a pastor." It's 
Sometimes these are burdens that God puts on your life and you just do it. And uh, by the way, this job isn't for the faint of heart because you see, you have to understand that pastors carry a burden, a burden for their people, a burden to make sure that the word is true and rich, a, a burden for God's presence, a burden to see people set free and living for Christ, right? And a lot of times people don't see the other side of ministry. They see the pulpit, the long hours that are poured in prayer. Study, preparation, meetings, counseling, and on top of that, having to be a good father and a good husband, and we fail there many times and, and all these other things. But And it can be very heavy, but as I listened to them share about those things, uh, and listen, I was listening to one of them who was sharing how they had friends that were so close to them that when the ministry closed, people they thought they were going to do life with, only to have them turn their backs on them and leave them. And I could hear the sh you know, you can hear the quiver in the voice. And he says, these are people that I prayed through some of the heaviest issues of their life. We cried together and did things together only to walk away and use COVID as an excuse to leave. They were hurting. And as I, I'm trying, I'm trying to find the words. I'm like, okay, God, what do I say? Because there's no way to say things. But, but one of them, that he says, but I thank God for the hurt. That's what he said. He says, I thank God for the hurt. And I, and I kind of sat there perplexed, and he says, because it reminds me of how God feels about us. Wow. He says, how many times we're unfaithful to God, but he still loves us. <sighs> Do you know that God loves us so much that he gave his own son so that we could experience his grace, his goodness, his love? That's why we got to ask him to break our heart. I promise you if, you, if you, if you're selfish now, you won't pray. You won't be when you pray this prayer. If, you, if you've been accused of being proud and arrogant and selfish, this is your prayer. God, break my heart. Let God consume you with a burden. I don't know what it is. But here's the Here's the one thing that you have to be careful about. That when he does give you a burden and you move to action, don't ever, ever move to action and allow the burden become your God. Because that can become a God. I've seen when people say, well, I've got to do this, but God says, stop. Don't ever let your burden become your God. God will move you to action to do something about it that's it, obey him. Would you stand? I want to pray for us as we prepare to leave. Father, we ask today in the name of Jesus, your son. Father, would you break our hearts? Come on, if that's your prayer, break our hearts. Break us out of our comfort, out of, out of our pursuit of everything that is easy. Even God, break us out of spiritual apathy, Father. Lord, I thank you, Father God, Lord, that you're going to do something great in our lives, Father God, with this burden, with this desire, whatever it is, Father Lord, each one of us has called. You're calling us to do something. You're calling us to move to action, Father God, and I thank you that our greatest blessing is going to be the, on the other side of pain. It's going to be on the other side of the greatest brokenness of our life, Jesus. And I pray, Father God, from the youngest to the oldest in this room, Father God, that you would consume us with a passion and you would consume us with a burden, Father God, to move to action, to share your name, to share your goodness, to share the love of Christ, Father God, with those that don't have it, Jesus. Father, you are the enabler. You are the anointed one, Father. I pray in Jesus' name that as you break us, Father God, and reshape us, you will anoint us to do it, Father. Lord, we thank you. We take your word. We, Father God, we take the charge in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And we all said, amen and amen. Go be burdened. Go be burdened. Let's change the world. <laughs>